You know, I, I get um, one of the opportunities of my job is I get to meet some fascinating people. And um, so I really get an opportunity now to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Professor Sir Michael Monmouth. Let me tell you a little bit about Mike. Um, as many of you know, he is really the guy that has pulled together this concept, amongst others in the world, but really focused this issue on the social determinants of health. He's really gotten our attention uh, on this issue globally. He just recently finished chairing a commission for the World Health Organization on the social determinants of health, um, which we believe um, really will set up a conceptual framework on how we should approach this issue. In the year 2000, he was nodded by Her Majesty the Queen for services to epidemiology and understanding the whole issue of health inequities, um, which certainly has you know, received international acclaim. He's vice president of the Academia Europea, a former and associate member of the Institute of Medicine, and a chair of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, again set up by the World Health Organization. He won the Baselian Prize for Epidemiology in 2004, and um, gave the Heverian Oration in 2006, and won the William B. Graham Prize for Health Service and Research for 2008. Now, you know, those are, those are awards which obviously are, are important, but um, let me tell you um, a little personal story. So I'm sitting up um, in my office um, trying to figure out, you know, really who would be best to talk to us at this really um, um, time of transition around public health. Um, and an email came across my desk um, of an exchange that I saw with some of our members uh, and Michael, um, basically with him giving his regrets that he was not able to make it for one of their sessions that they were trying to pull together. Um, and kind of amusing the fact that, uh, well, if it was just a day or two earlier, he could probably make it. So a um, light bulb went off, and I got my BlackBerry out and sent him a quick email, and, um, and he was able to make it. Um, and I just tell you, he flew here from London last night. He'll be with us today. He's hopping on a plane tonight and hopping back through London to go to Stockholm. So he wanted to be here. And with that, um, I just really want to bring to the podium my friend, um, Sir Michael Mahmoud. Now, one other thing, um, um, when we were, I was in London fairly recently, and we missed another opportunity um, to give an award uh, to Dr. Marmot. So I'd like to bring Professor Alan Myron Davis back up from the Royal Society of Public Health for just one moment for a special presentation. Thank you, Georges. Thank you, Georges. Um, the Royal Society for Public Health, just to continue where I left off, um, has approximately 7,000 members worldwide um, and confers over 100,000 qualifications per year. Now, that may be small beer in American terms, but it's uh, pretty big in, in UK terms. It works, uh, the society works closely with the UK Departments of Health, the European Union, and the World Health Organization, and it's a new and strong, uh, powerful voice for public health in the UK and globally. Um, the accolade of honorary fellowship of the Royal Society for Public Health is, is a rare distinction. Um, only a handful are awarded each year to people who've truly distinguished themselves and are at the very top of their game. And without doubt, Professor Sir Michael Marmot is absolutely at the top of his game. Uh, I first met Michael uh, back in the, uh, in the 70s, the 1970s, <laughs> um, when Michael was uh, working on the Whitehall studies under uh, Professor Jeffrey Rose and looking at the effects of social gradient on health outcomes. And I was working at the Health Education Council and Michael advised us on reaching disadvantaged people. So even in those early days, uh, that journey is con uh, continues right up now to today the, with the uh, publication of the Commission on, the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And this report is hugely important and re-energizes the whole debate about social justice that began with those Victorian social reformers. And I have very great pleasure indeed in conferring um, the Honorary Fellowship of the Royal Society for Public Health on Professor Sir Michael Marmot.
my goodness, what a lot of people. <laughs> it has been a long journey, and I don't mean coming from London to San Diego. I mean coming um, from the 1970s and doing research on the social gradient in health and trying to take it to the point, having been a researcher all my life, uh, when people asked me at the end of the publishing a paper, the question, so what? I would say, another paper. <laughs> That's what you do. Maybe I'm just getting older, but I think the so what question is the one that I want to address today. And it was indeed the motivation for agreeing to chair the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And we published our report on the 28th of August. If I could have my slides up. Um, that's a wonderful logo, but I'm gonna be a little inhibited if I have to speak to that for 20 minutes. We, we published the report on the 28th of August, and we called it Closing the Gap in a Generation. It was a statement that it was the judgment of the Commission that we have the knowledge to make an enormous difference. Do I think that the gap, the health gap, will close in a generation? No, I don't, because I don't think that we will apply the knowledge that we have. But in a way, the challenge that I want to put before you today and that the Commission tried to put before the global community when it published its report is that we do have the knowledge. We do know what to do to close the health gap in a generation. It was put to us at the beginning of the Commission's work that no government would take us seriously unless we could show that it was good for the economy to improve health and reduce health inequities. I resisted that argument stubbornly. And the events of the last weeks, I would say, bear that out. The position we took was that improving health and promoting health equity was a matter of social justice. We should do it because it is the right thing to do. And if we don't do it, If we don't do it, having in our hands the means to make a difference, we will rightly be judged harshly for that failure. We put at the heart of what we were considering with the Commission empowerment of individuals, of communities, and indeed of whole countries. And we see empowerment as having the dimensions of material well-being. If you can't afford to feed your children, you can't be empowered. Psychosocial, having control over your life, and political, having voice. And the Commission was seeking to create the conditions for people to lead flourishing lives. One of the criticisms that predictably we got in recommending action on the social determinants of health, aren't you taking away from individuals their own responsibility. And my argument is absolutely not. What we are trying to do is to create the conditions where people can take control over their own lives. They cannot control their own lives. They cannot make decisions that improve their health without material, psychosocial, and political empowerment. And that's what we're seeking to achieve. Please bring my slides back. Um, <laughs> there's this condition reflex. When you clap, they think it's all over. And so <laughs> Why now? I could expand on that at some length, but I won't. I would say there is a tide running in our favor at the moment, but we have to seize that tide uh, if we don't, it'll run into the sand. We have the opportunity to make a difference. I'd like to think that the election that you're having here quite soon, at long last, 
And uh, Americans think cricket is boring. <laughs> <laughs> this is the moment. The Commission was concerned with health inequalities within and between countries, and we took the position that health inequalities that are judged to be avoidable are unfair, and hence labelled health inequities. And I'll say a word about the social gradient. When we published our report, you wouldn't know it from the US press because it was ignored completely. Uh, if you read the British press, it was widely covered, but you would think our report was all about Glasgow. Men in the worst off area of the Scottish city of Glasgow have a life expectancy of 54. In the best off, they have a life expectancy of 82 a 28-year difference in life expectancy. Now, I know that in the US, rightly, you are concerned about differential access to health care. We in Britain have a national health service. It's not perfect. It's close to universal access, but there are differences. But everybody in Glasgow has access to primary health care free at the point of use. And there is a 28-year difference in life expectancy. Life expectancy for men in Glasgow is eight years shorter than the average in India. In India, 80% of the population lives on $2 a day or less. No one in Glasgow lives on $2 a day or less. You turn on the tap in Glasgow, and the, sorry, the faucet, the, and the water that comes out is safe to drink. There's sanitation, people have enough calories, and they have shelter. And yet there is that 28-year gap. In Washington, D.C., 63 life expectancy for black men. In Montgomery, Montgomery County, Maryland, close by, it's 80, a 17-year difference. And I show the Glasgow figures along with the Washington, D.C. figures because you might immediately jump to the conclusion that the Washington DC versus Montgomery County, Maryland is because of lack of access to health care. It has to be the right thing to do to construct a health care system that has universal access regardless of ability to pay. But do not for one moment believe that if you achieve that you will abolish health inequities. Very little of that 17-year gap between Washington, D.C. and Montgomery County, Maryland could be attributed to lack of health care. I make no comment about the Cuban figures versus the U.S. other than to say uh, it's one of the triumphs of U.S. foreign policy. <laughs> which is not, I know, setting the bar very high. Um, <laughs> I said I wanted to touch on the gradient. In showing you the figures for the poorest versus the richest part of Glasgow, it's possible to think that the problem is the poorest of the poor, that we have to address the problem of the poorest of the poor. In the Whitehall study of British civil servants, no one lives on $2 a day or less, the global definition of poverty. And yet, there's a social gradient. The lower you are in the hierarchy, the higher the mortality, and it continues to the older stage. And if you say British civil servants may be wonderful people, but we're not going to make health policy on the basis of the British civil service, then here's life expectancy at age 25 by education in the US. It is a social gradient. And the implications of that, I think, are quite profound. If you focus on the poorest of the poor, we can all sign up. Politicians of all parties can sign up to the aim of eradicating poverty. But the social gradient means that we have to take action across the whole of society. We're all involved. If people second from the top have worse health than those at the top, people third from the top have worse health than those second from the top, we're all involved. And that 
implies social action across the whole of society. And so important is the education that it has a profound effect on health. It's been estimated that medical advances averted 180,000 adult deaths in the US between 1996 and 2002. That's enormous, absolutely enormous. When you think of any other figure for deaths, whether it's Iraq or 9-11 or whatever it is, 180,000 adult deaths averted is enormous. A great triumph of the medical system. Addressing educational inequalities would have saved 1.4 million lives. I know that it is of deep concern the issue of racial ethnic differences in the US. We put in the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health this figure that in the US 886,202 deaths would have been averted between 91 and 2000 if the mortality rates between whites and African Americans were equalized. One member of this association commenting on this figure said in a most moving email, do we really need more lessons on the social determinants of health before we begin to act? 800,000 is far too many painful lessons for me. It is a global commission, and people tend to think that when you're thinking about poverty and inequalities and inequities in health globally, the issue is so much to do with communicable disease. We know, of course, that in every region of the world, other than the very poorest, the major burden of disease is, of course, non-communicable disease, injuries and violence, and in the poorest, regions approximately equal burden from communicable disease and non-communicable disease. And they have the double burden. When we look at something like obesity that we think as being a problem for the rich countries, indeed it is, but look at Mexico. Look at Brazil. Obesity increasingly is becoming a problem for all middle-income countries as well as high-income countries. We said very little in the report of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health about climate change. But I think it's absolutely vital to bring the agendas together. When the Commission conducted a workshop in New Orleans, it was very clear to us that one shouldn't speak of natural disasters, one should talk of natural phenomena. It's social organization that turns natural phenomena into natural disasters. And it is always the disadvantaged who suffer most. And we saw it in New Orleans, and we see it globally. Deaths from climate change uh, are affecting people in poor countries much more than in rich. Our conclusion from three years of work was that it really is achievable. We really can make a difference to health equity. But we do have to change our focus. Imagine you're wrestling with an alligator in a swamp. The alligator is health inequity, and we're fighting with each other as to whether we should take action on smoking, or obesity, or safe sex, or universal health insurance. Haftan Mahler, the powerful, inspirational former director general of WHO, in a speech to the World Health Assembly in 1986, said, when you're up to your neck in mud fighting alligators, remember, you came to drain the swamp in the first place. That's the challenge, and that's what the Commission set out to do. The areas for action identified by the Commission were firstly the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. Secondly, the structural drivers of those conditions at global, national, and local level. 
And thirdly, the importance of monitoring, training, and research. I began by saying I've spent my whole life in research. I'm not going to forget that past, but what I now realize is how important it is for the research and the action to go on at the same time. Goethe says it better than I. It's not enough to know, you must also use the knowledge. It's not enough to wish, you must also act. Thinking in order to act, acting in order to think, that's the sum of all wisdom. We have to marshal the knowledge that we have and try and put it into action, but we have continually to be critical of what we're doing, to evaluate it, and to say, how can we make a difference? I want, in this short time, just to give you a couple of examples of the evidence we gathered. And I was talking to some colleagues this morning, and they said, how do you get the message across? And I said, for me, it's with the evidence. Let the evidence talk. In Europe, we've been talking about health in all policies. The Commission said we should screen all policies for their impact, not just on health, but on health equity. Fair financing. Let me just show you an example. This slide from our Nordic Knowledge Network from the Commission looks at the proportion of people who are relatively poor. Poverty was defined as less than 60% median income. And for those at the back who may not be able to see this, if you look at the figures for the US and the UK, pre-tax poverty levels in the US are lower than in the UK. The effect of tax and benefits, income redistribution, is to reduce poverty levels in the US by 24% and to reduce them in the UK by 50%. The Minister of Finance is involved in ethical decision making. The actions of the Minister of Finance have a fundamental impact on health inequity. Yes, economics is important. Not so much the economics of the actions that we in the health sector take, but the fact that the Minister of Finance can make a decision. What would we like? the poverty levels to be, high or low. It's within the decision-making power of the government. Look, for example, at Finland, Norway, Sweden. The effect of redistribution there is to reduce poverty levels by over 70%. This is not given by God or Darwin, depending who your favorite is. <laughs> this is given by the Minister of Finance. And we have global responsibilities. Look at the figures for Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. This is government revenues from direct taxation, from sales tax, and from the tariffs on trade. Now, if we negotiate in favor of free trade, and we say to a government, you have to remove your tariff barriers. We are at a stroke removing between 30 and 40% of government revenue. Free trade may be a good thing, although I wish we practiced it in Europe. Uh, the subsidy to European agriculture in one week is equal to the subsidy to African agriculture in one year and we call that free trade. But if we believed in free trade instead of the monumental hypocrisy that we now practice, we would have to come up with alternate arrangements before stripping a government of 40% of its revenue and then saying you've got to invest in education and health care and social protection. And continuing the fair financing theme, the blue line there shows the proportion of gross national income from the rich countries that goes to overseas development assistance. The rich countries committed themselves 
to giving 0.7% of gross national income in overseas development assistance. It's now around 03 And as our incomes have grown, the proportion that we give hasn't grown in the same way. And that's overseas development assistance aid. We need to put that in a context. And here, the context is debt service. You can see the small bars going out to the right are development assistance, and the bars to the left are service on debts. In the mid-90s, about $50 billion a year went from the rich countries to the developing countries. Now, $600 billion a year comes out of the developing countries into the coffers of the rich countries. Fair financing means coming to grips with what we're doing. Healthy places. We put in our report an estimate that it would cost $100 billion to upgrade the world's slums. Currently, 1 billion people in the world live in slums. And when we put that as the chief writer, editor of the report, and I thought, can we really say that? It looks such a silly sum of money, $100 billion. My government put 500 billion pounds, when, you, when they did that, it was worth about $900 billion. Now it's worth about $750 billion. But put $900 billion into saving the banks. For one-ninth of that, every urban dweller could have clean running water and sanitation. Please don't tell me that we haven't got the money we have the money. We choose to use it in particular ways. Our commissioner from India, working in Gujarat, as part of the Self-Employed Women's Association, I'll say a word about that before I end, said to the women, the poorest women in India who are part of the Self-Employed Women's Association, what do you want? And they said, the first thing, we do not want to move into concrete blocks. We'd like better housing, but we want to stay where we are. But we would like running water. We would like a bathroom. We'd like somewhere to cook. For $500 per household, they achieved that. The women themselves had to contribute $50 to that. And that's enormous. If you're living on $1 to $2 a day, $50 is enormous. So the women themselves were sufficiently committed that they had to contribute. And following the investment in these slums, there was improvement in health, decline in waterborne diseases. The children started going to school. The women were able to take paid work, no longer having to stand in long lines to collect water. Universal health care. I said that this is not the panacea, but it is very important. Every year, 100 million people are forced into poverty because of catastrophic out of pocket health care expenditure. And a large number of other people are not quite forced into poverty, but severely disadvantaged. But it's not just a healthcare system. Let me take you back to a paper we published a couple of years ago. In the US, you spend $6,000 per head on medical care, and we in the UK spend $2,560 adjusting for purchasing power. And the question is, what do you get for that? And the answer is, not much. This is health differences between England and the US in men and women aged 55 to 64, that was white men and women to try and get the cross-national comparison more appropriate. You can see the social gradient there 
uh, classified here by income, you can see the social gradient for heart disease and diabetes and for s uh, four other major conditions. But at each level of income, the Americans were sicker than the English. 92% of this sample had access to health insurance, had health insurance. It was not a health care issue. Is it reasonable? Is it rational? Is it logical to be optimistic? I would say yes. That's an evidence-based optimism. Look at what's happened to under five mortality rates in country after country. Look, for example, at Egypt. In 1970, under five mortality rates were in excess of 230 per thousand live births. By 2005, it was down to about 30 to 35. In fact, the rates in Egypt in 2005 were below the rates in Portugal or Greece 30 years earlier. We can make dramatic changes very quickly. In fact, the main issue for most of these countries is now the persisting inequities within the country so that the gains are more fairly shared. I'm also optimistic because things are happening. In Brazil, they set up a Commission on Social Determinants of Health as a, a daughter of the WHO Commission. They produced their report also in August. This is President Lula, looking pretty pleased, I would say, holding a copy of the Brazilian report with the health minister, the minister of the governor of the state, and the president of the commission. You probably can't see that, but that is me. Uh, I'm not the one with the turban. I'm the, the, I'm the other one. Uh, with the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh. And he, you probably can't quite see that, but he is holding a copy of our report. And he said, what do you want me to do? I wouldn't have the courage to tell somebody who's the prime minister of a country of nearly 1.1 billion people what he should be doing. But I did say that if you look at our report, the recommendations are rather general. They had to be. We're dealing with sub-Saharan Africa and rural and urban India and Glasgow and Washington DC and everything else. They had to be fairly general. It would be wonderful, I said to him, if you could take the report and develop solutions, practical policies that are appropriate for India. It would be good for India and it would be good for the world. But what if governments don't act? It is important to get sign up from the top of government and many governments in the American region, particularly Latin America, Canada, but strikingly not the United States of America, have signed up. So then what? Do you throw up your hands? I was in California earlier this year and people were throwing up their hands saying, the government won't act, there's nothing we can do. So I showed them the example that one or two of you will have seen before, coming back to the Self-Employed Women's Association of India. When the, the commission made a site visit to India, we were given some insight into the lives of the vegetable sellers. These women sit all day with a little rag in front of them and a few vegetables, and they sit in the market and they sell these vegetables. And the women, of course, were being ripped off by loan sharks who were lending the money at rates exceeding 20% interest a month. SAVER, the Self-Employed Women's Association, started a bank, the SAVER Bank microcredit scheme. I went to a meeting of the governors of this bank. I've never been invited to Bank of America governors or Barclays Bank, but the SAVER Bank. And at the end of it, these women in their colored saris sit there and they sing the Gujarati version of We Shall Overcome with clenched fist. I'm not sure if they do that in Bank of America. But, um, <laughs> They were being ripped off by the vegetable wholesalers. Saver became the middlewoman, 
buying from the growers at reasonable prices and selling to the retailers at reasonable prices. They were being harassed by the police. Seva fought to the Supreme Court of India for the right of these women to pursue their trade. And of course, the children were sitting there in the sun and the monsoon rains. Seva started childcare. And they get sick. Seva started health services. I've already talked to you about the housing. And now they have a new problem, pensions. And when Mirai Chatterjee, who you saw in the photo with Manmohan Singh, who was a member of the commission, she said that when she was asked to join the commission, she asked the members, these women, should I join? And the members said to her, go and tell them what our lives are like. Tell them what we live every day of our lives. It's not difficult. Go and tell them about us. And Seva, and I would hope that this distinguished organization of the American Public Health Association will be part of building a social movement for action on the social determinants of health and health equity. Martin Luther King said, we're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. I quote Dr. Singh because it was pointed out to me that we published the report on the 28th of August, which was the 40th anniversary of his I Have a Dream speech. David Satcher, who was one of our commissioners, quoted Benjamin Elijah Mays at Martin Luther King's funeral, saying the tragedy is not to have your dreams unfulfilled. The tragedy is not to dream in the first place. I would like you to dream with me and to dream of a world where social justice is taken seriously. <laughs>